morning. Good morning. Welcome to Hope Presbyterian Church. It's great to be worshiping with you all on this Sunday morning. Um, I'm Pastor Todd Johnson here at Hope. We are a community finding hope in Jesus and extending that hope to others. It's what we do because it's what God is about. And so again, I, I welcome you. Just reminding you, you'll want to worship God. Let's see what things do I want to remind you about. When worship God, there is a bathroom there, but the less obvious ones, conspicuous ones, like in the middle of a sermon, if you go down <laughs> through a little door underneath the uh, stairs into uh, right underneath this side, there's the men's and women's uh, under there. Um, and then as well, uh, I don't announce it very well that often, but um, we have the children. Children are free to go with Emma to the back during the sermon. Um, is where we'll take care of the children. I think that's everything for now. Um, on these last weeks of summer, on a beautiful day, right? well, at least last, sorry, I just made eye contact with over the mountain where summer's over and school has started, I forgot. Last weeks of summer for those of us on this side of the mountain. <laughs> but um, let's pause for a moment of silence and we'll prepare our hearts for work. <laughs> Amen. Many years ago, um, there was our kids were still little, I remember, and I was I was going through a really, really hard time. And I remember this particular day when uh, we were rushing to get out of the house and everybody got in the van and we climbed in and Todd had a CD on in the rate on the in the van and it was this song and the opening line. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come to you, is what played. And I just broke down, just like I am right now. I just broke down at the thought of God calling us out of things that are destructive and dehumanizing and into something beautiful. That is exactly what we're doing here this morning. And I'm wondering what pops into your mind at the thought of God calling you out of something this morning. What is it? Is it one of the things that we sang? Is it bondage? Is it sorrow? Is it loss? Is it the earth's clamor? Is it tempest in your life right now? And what is it he might be calling you into this morning? Freedom, calm, love, shelter, any and all of those are what he is calling us into. Yours is particular to you because God sees you and knows you this moment. What a joy it is to step into worship with a God like that. Would you rise please as we are called into his presence with one another to worship him. <clears throat> praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. It is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble, and casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. Pray with me, please. Our great God, high and majestic, lifted up, creator of all things, the one who by his very word called all things into existence, who by your providential sustaining hands keeps us breathing, keeps plants growing, keeps the earth rotating, keeps the stars in their place. Would you really stoop this morning to see us, to see me, to see each of us in those things that we lay be behind us and step into all that you call us into, into life and freedom and hope? Do you really have our names written on the palms of your hands? Are you that mighty and that good and that personal that our life can be so enfolded in you that we need not fear or look anywhere else for life? Yes, you tell us that is exactly who you are. And so we come this morning, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, giving ourselves anew to you that we might receive even more than we could ask or imagine. Amen. Thank you. 
Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 5. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God does not look lightly on our sin, and so it's um, important that we not take it lightly either. And so we take time now to confess individually and corporately that we might receive his bountiful antidote <laughs> for our sin. So please join me. Lord, in your mercy, we ask. Save, save us from selfish ambitions, greed, and the love of power. Lord, in your mercy, we ask. Rescue us from grumbling and complaining, from negativity and lack of faith. Lord, in your mercy, we ask. Forgive us for misusing and abusing the wonderful gifts in nature you have provided for us to use and enjoy. And hear now our silent confession. Exchange. We trade our transgression for Christ's righteousness. He takes our pain. He takes our sin. And so we are met with really, really good news. Brothers and sisters, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We are brothers and sisters through his blood. We have died together. We will rise together. We will live together. Please do rise now in that great hope, whether in body or in spirit, as you're able. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And in doing so, we have been given peace with God. Now we greet one another in that peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Please extend that peace to one another. Peace be with you online. giving of God's tithes and our offerings as we are in his presence. Um, we collect offering here. I remind you, there's a tin back there. We don't pass plates. Checks would be made out to Trinity Presbyterian Church as we're still working on being an organized church. Um, or you can give online, uh, of course. But 
we give ourselves our very more than our money we want to give ourselves and so we each week pray a prayer toward that end join me in view of your mercies lord we give ourselves to you all that i am and all that i have i offer to you O lord amen amen Reminding you of things going on in the life of our family, just a few that I will mention. One, we have a picnic immediately after this, so we'll be out there. I mean, what? We have had hot summer, a hot summer, and every picnic so far has been beautiful. Um, so this is beautiful weather. Thank you, Lord, seeing his goodness in the land of the living. Um, new members tonight. I know some people are coming back into town for this, but we will be at my house, 4.30 to 7.30. Uh, if you're coming and I did not you weren't on the previous emails, uh, let me know if you're coming, but I think we're gonna have a good good crew there. Um, uh, as well, it's uh, the Daily Prayer Project. I announced last week that we have new worship guides for that. I have them. If you read your morning and evening prayer with us, if you like the printed version, pick it up for me today. I know a number of people forgot last week, so uh, grab that from me today. Uh, other than that, I think, well, you have the things on the back of the, uh, of your worship guide, which the second one down, uh, Dave is going to come talk about that right now, right? I think. Come on up. Sorry, here we go. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> As I say every time, she's no St. Francis of Assisi. So. <laughs> gonna have a moment of silence for the volume. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to make an announcement. There's one combine a few things. Uh, one of the things we've been talking about in the leadership group is trying to think about missions and outreach. And how does that, how do we incorporate that in the life of the church? Um, and especially, I think, is where a church is particularizing. You know, I think a big part of the DNA of, of a church should be how, how do we give? Um, I thought it was great in morning prayer. One of the passages this last week was 2 Corinthians 8. Um, I think this helps give a kind of a good mindset as we as we think about how do we think about giving. Um, so it says in chapter eight, and how, now brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. Those words don't usually go together very well, do they? Um, but out of, out of their out overflowing joy, their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. That's a great thing for us to think about as a church is how how do we want to look at giving how do we want to think about how do we serve i mean i love just all the gray makes you know when gray gets up and gives his announcements about bingo it's not just kind of blah blase this isn't exciting it's something that's really fun it's enjoyable how do we give how do we think about going um, as we think about missions in addition kind of love the phrase to to pray, give, or go. You know, it's not, our response isn't just to do nothing. One of the easy responses that we can do is Love Inc., uh, which is love in the name of Christ. And I think they do a wonderful job. So they've got a pamphlet uh, here in the back, but also for the next few weeks, we're going to have a basket or a, what is that, a Rubbermaid tub back there for personal care items. And we've put a list in the back of some of the things they have asked for. Uh, and I think just in recent times, their personal care closet has gotten quite depleted. And so I think one way that we can serve really well in the name of Christ is to actually give items. Um, and so please grab, please look at this um, as you go out to give a sense about their overall ministries. But also then grab this list to think about what you can bring over the next few weeks just for personal care items. Thanks. Thank you. Um, let's continue in prayer. The prayers of the people. We obviously, uh, Love Inc. is one of the ministries our church supports. I don't, I need to reprint it. I don't know if you have, uh, 
the list of our missions that we, we support, Love Inc. is one that our church gives towards. So we want to pray for them and their ministry right now in light of this opportunity, as we have an opportunity to partner with them. Uh, as well, there are a number of health things in our church. We kind of got uh, slammed this week. A, a number of people are home uh, not feeling well, from Paul to Justice Kruma. Um, but as well, two biggies that I, I want to mention, as some of you know, Jim and Cindy are not here because her father fell and they're on the road trying to get to him in Kansas. Um, and so just pray, pray for their safe travel right now, but also for his healing and for wisdom on how to set him up um, in light of this, this fall. Um, and then as well, Judy uh, asked me to share, she tested positive for COVID yesterday morning. She's feeling fine. It's kind of cold, she said. She wants, she'd asked just that the symptoms would stay mild and that they pass. And then especially that Lou wouldn't get it. They quarantined from one another. So as we continue this journey of these things, but they've asked for those prayers. Uh, mentioning other things in our community, um, as many of you know from the news, there was a family, the Davenport family in Old Trail lost their house uh, this week as it burned down. And so um, it would be right for us to pray for one of our neighbors, absolutely. Um, and then other needs that you're aware of. Um, so, okay. Let's just pause. I'm gonna, we're going to do what we have been doing, kind of popcorn. As you feel led, pray quickly for one of those. Um, but let's uh, pray loudly so that you can be heard, but also know there's no compulsion. No, no one is forced here to pray. If you don't feel comfortable, someone else will pray for these items. I'll start us. I'll close us. Gracious Father, we, your people, come with these uh, various needs and even this ministry. Well, I'll go ahead and take Love, Inc., um, we do thank you for uh, their gift that they are to our community to help us uh, care for those who are in need and to do it wisely as they function both as a service place of a place to give practical needs and connect people to um, resources, government resources and agencies, as well as a clearinghouse to make sure that we, the church, are not scammed for there are so many people who desire to, uh, to scam churches. Lord, uh, so we pray for their ministry. But of course, Lord, in that we are praying for those that they minister to, that you would bring blessing and life and um, flourishing is the odd word we use more and more in their life. And we pray even for those that want to um, scam, as I keep using that word, that, that do not have the best intentions, that you would have mercy on them and work as well. So, Father, hear our prayers. Lord, we do pray that you would give uh, Jim and Cindy safe travel as a long drive. Uh, pray that they would be a great comfort to Cindy's dad, to the family. Uh, pray that he is not in great pain. Um, and pray that you'd help them with logistics of uh, setting up care for him going forward. Thank you. Lord, we pray for the Davenport and Old Trail. Lord, we pray um, for every aspect of their life now, uh, the emotional toll of fire has taken to all the logistics and the financial aspect. Lord, we pray that they know you, and if they don't know you, that this would draw them to you. I also pray for their neighbors who Thankfully, it looks like not too much damage, but are going to be living next to the damage and the rebuilding for quite some time, and it's going to be disrupted. We just pray for that community that you draw it to yourself. We lift up the Valentes and ask that, <clears throat> that you would indeed keep Lou safe from getting infected. We pray, Lord, for Judy that she would not be unduly uncomfortable with this if it's a cold or let it pass quickly let it be mild and let this be a time when they can receive from you from your hand directly grace grace for one another grace from one another And we pray for Paul, Lord, that um, whatever the source of his pain is, um, will be able to be determined real soon by the appropriate 
physicians. We pray for his comfort in the meantime and for peace of mind. Lord, I agree. Hear these prayers work in our broken world. We, we lift our eyes more broadly and today in light of where our passage will go about suffering for the name of Christ. Um, we think of our brothers and sisters in various nations from Afghanistan to North Korea to Somalia to Nepal to the other areas in the Middle East. Lord, even our partner churches that we gave two years ago in China, where there are pastors now sitting in prison. Father, strengthen your persecuted church. We need them to teach us what deep faith looks like. Um, but would you please comfort and strengthen and use their witness to grow your church? For that is our prayer, our call, that your kingdom would come that your church would grow and your glory and fame spread. In your name we ask these things. Amen. We now give our attention to the New Testament lesson. Our New Testament reading is from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to, to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Let's ask the Lord in our prayer song to teach our souls to love the truth. never had an operation, never gone under the knife. Some of the young kids, yes, you are dismissed children to go with Emma. All right, yeah, some of our students. But, uh, you know, I, if you've ever had a procedure, especially one where you're going to go under anesthesia, I love the way the hospitals do it for us. They hold our hand and prepare us so well, don't they? I mean, the fact that I, I don't go to surgery every day, multiple times a day, like, the doctors and nurses do. And so they just go like, it's not a big deal. But instead, right, the last one I went in was a shoulder surgery and they're like, okay, first you go, to, they call and tell me you're gonna go to the second floor. That's take the elevator, park here, the elevator down, and they'll process you and get your paperwork done. Then I finished with that person and they go, now you're gonna walk down here to the waiting room where the nurse will meet you and they'll take you, they'll take you in into your vitals and get you changed so you can get ready for surgery. So they did that. And then when I finished that, the nurse said, now we're gonna walk to pre-op and then it was there that the anesthesiologist came in and said, let me, let's talk about what's going to happen here. And you're going to go in and right. And the doctor came in. They did all of this to prepare, to let me know. So I wasn't caught off guard. What a great gift. You know, I, I wish there were more things in life that did that for us, right? Gave us the, the here's what's going to happen in your future. Here's what's going to come today. 
especially when it comes to things that we don't expect, such as suffering. Right? Do you, do you see that today in our passage, Peter is sort of being like the, what the hospitals do, and that he's going like, Let, let's talk about what life is going to involve as you leave these doors and as you go on, that there is this thing suffering <laughs> for those who follow Christ, especially in a unique way. And, and let's talk about what that might mean and how to gain some perspective on it. And, and to let me give you a little advance warning and prepare you for it. And so we come going, what is he trying to tell us? <laughs> what might we glean from this as we prepare and think about suffering? Because suffering can come on us if you're like me as a very unwelcome house guest. <laughs> And, um, and then we wrestle with it. And whether you believe in Jesus or not, you will face it. And so how do we now, whether you're in it now or whether it is to come at some point, Peter is saying we prepare for it. It's, it's interesting. We've been in this series of, in First Peter. We had a three-week break, so welcome back. I forgot to say that into this, this series because we had three psalms as I was on vacation and then uh, Jim preached last week. But we're back into picking up this flow. And as you remember, Peter has been talking about the fact that the church is a group of resident aliens. They are a part of another colony living in this world. They were in Asia Minor that he's writing, but he's saying you should feel this sort of homesickness and this oddity of where you are and what you live. And he's been talking all about that. Yet in it, you do good. He has already twice talked about suffering, chapter 2, chapter 3, and now in chapter 4 he does. But the interesting thing that commentators point out is that in this chapter, it's much more of a certainty. In chapter 2, he said, if you suffer for doing good. In chapter 3, he said, if you suffer, right? Now he says, there's no if here in this passage. I need to open to the passage. Um, it just is. Don't be surprised by it. So what are we to consider here? It's important that we listen to this. If you're a Christian, it's important that we listen to this because this is saying it is part of your life. If you're not yet a Christian, it would be interesting. I encourage you to listen. We're so glad that you're here. We know that folks are from all over the spectrum of considering things of Jesus. But this might be an interesting time to consider what are the resources Christians are claiming that Jesus gives in the midst of suffering? So... With those ideas, I want to organize our thoughts, okay? Here's where we're at, where you note takers. It's basically the how, the what, and the why. The how, the what, and the why. That is, how are Christians to respond in suffering? The what, really what, seriously, suffering, right? We're just gonna to have to address that one. And then thirdly, the why Christians can respond. So first, the how of Christians responding to suffering. Notice uh, what Peter says, beloved, don't, verse 12, keep the verses out in front of you. Don't be surprised at this fiery trial. That's a way he de describes it uh, that comes on you to test. But notice in verse 13 what he says, how do you respond? But rejoice. Have this radical joy, right? Is that our first response? No. Is that a human response to suffering? No. But he's saying Christians respond in joy. And not just that, but it's like a joy beyond joy because he then goes on that you uh, rejoice, first command of rejoice, as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad. That's a, a compound phrase that uses some different words to really be, be the NIV translates it, be overjoyed. To have an overjoy in the midst of suffering. And then he goes on. You probably caught the word. And I think I used the same title for my sermon three weeks there, five weeks ago, because it talked about being blessed in suffering in, in verses in chapter three. So this really should the title of this should be Blessed Suffering Reprise. But um, in verse 14, he talks about the fact that in suffering you consider yourself blessed. And then in 16, it's that you're not to be ashamed. Sometimes in suffering, we experience shame. Think about that. Whenever you suffer, if you believe in a God, you say, one of your actions could be, did I do something wrong? Is he punishing me? That's a reaction of shame. And so he's saying, don't be ashamed. Now, it's also how you relate to others. But, but there's these... What is true of how the response happens? Christians should be at a place to not experience that shame. And then in light of that, verse 16, you're giving glory. You're praising God. 
in the midst of, of suffering, that you glory in the name of suffering as a Christian. Because again, this is unique suffering of being a Christian type of suffering. And then verse 19, what's the response? How do Christians respond? You commit yourself to God. So this commitment, this confident faith in your faithful creator, and then you do good. That theme that we've seen in Peter, this, this idea that even in my hardship, I have resources to bless others, to do good in my community as a resident alien. What is Peter doing here? And this is important. How are we to respond? We are to respond as the resident aliens that we are. By that I mean, let's put this in the broadest story, but here's, here's what I mean. We are to respond as people of the new creation. People who, remember he had talked about you've been born again to a living hope? Well, think of that big story of God that we always talk about, the big honking story. We had four, we're going to talk about this tonight in New Members, four chapters, four relationships. We were made to be in good relationship in Genesis 1 with God, ourselves, others in the world. These four relationships flourishing, but what happened? Sin entered the world, and everything went broken and violent and not working the way it was supposed to, and God promised to rescue it. And so this third chapter, from creation to brokenness to fall to and fall to fixing, to rescuing, God is doing all that through his Redeemer in Jesus. And he does it with the promise that one day all those relationships will be restored. That's an important big picture to know because it means resident aliens imbibe and embody that story. Why do I say that? Because what is true of the end chapter? When God comes, Revelation 21 and 22, he makes all things new, it says. No more violence, no more sin, no more hatred, no more persecution, no more uh, distance from God, no more earth, uh, a mess, but everything's healed, right? This all happens. What else is true? It's an age of blessing, according to the prophets. How did Peter tell you to respond? When you suffer? Be blessed. Is it an age of sorrow or an age of joy when that end comes? It's an age of joy, right? So what do we do in suffering? We rejoice in suffering. Do you see, you can take each of these things, the peace that we can have, the glory, because it's an age of ultimate glory, us being glorified and God being glorified. We are taking these things that are true of the end, Peter says, and you as resident aliens start imbibing them, excuse me, embodying them now in light of imbibing them. They start leaking out. I have this thought, kids, you've probably done a pinata recently, right? At a birthday party, I hope, or maybe you can do one at the next student ministry thing. But you know, when you have a pinata up, you, you have your stick and your blindfold and you are, people are whacking it and you're trying to get it going. And what starts happening at first? Like a Snickers flies out, right? Or a little piece of hard candy. It just starts kind of leaking a little bit of candy. But then, you know, there finally is that time when it gets whacked and it just explodes. And then what happens? That's when everybody goes, right? The Bible's view is that the kingdom has not yet exploded but the Snickers of the kingdom are dropping out all the time. And they're dropping out in God's people all the time as we stay connected to him. And so Peter's call here is to say, do you see this bigger story? This is how you respond by staying saturated in this story of what God is doing. That really is the whole point of this sermon, but I, I also was thinking this week as an example, many of you know Johnny Erickson Tata, and um, I plan on reading some of her stuff on my sabbatical because I need to learn from her a lot. Because the point is, as you know, she, uh, never mind, you might not know, she uh, was, is a quadriplegic now because she dove in, uh, in a pond and it was too shallow and she broke her neck and she lost, she's a quadriplegic. And in that, she went into this fury of like, I am going to beat this. I am going to find the right fix, the best doctors, get the surgeries, do all of that, and nothing worked. And so as she continued, she had to wrestle through her suffering. But in that, if you listen to her, she not only did that, but then about uh, 20 years ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then about, I think it was 10 years ago, she got re-diagnosed with breast cancer. My point is that if you listen to her now and read her writings, as this suffering has even increased, her joy has superabounded over it. And it baffles me. 
But my point is, God can do that in us. This new creation can happen in us as we continue to pursue God. That is the how. And so obviously this is difficult, which is where we're going to go in point two. But how are you, how, how, what's your typical way to respond when you're surprised by suffering, especially for the name of Jesus? So that's the first, the how. Peter sets a high bar, but he gives us this picture of us living out new creation now as resident aliens. Okay, the what? So the how are Christians to respond? Now the what, which I just simply wrote is what? Seriously? Suffering? Right? We, we, what's verse 1 say? He has to tell us, don't be surprised. Don't let it take you off guard when it comes upon you as though something strange, alien, was happening. There's some play on words here, but I'm already going to get into that. But it, right, aren't you always surprised? Like, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Which leads to, this has an A and a B, this point for you note takers, kind of the, um, the fact that there are legitimate reasons that we're surprised. But then there are, and say, what, seriously? But then there are also illegitimate reasons why we say, what, seriously? Okay? Let's explore those. First, the legitimate reasons. It's what I just said, that this is not the way it ought to be. Put it again in the big story. We were made for goodness. We were made that there would not be violence between one another, but that we would be like Adam who sings when he sees the first other human. But we were to rejoice in one another and bless one another. And instead, after sin, what happens? Chapter four, a brother kills a brother. And though you and I go, oh, I'd never be a murderer, or what's the phrase he uses here? I'd never be a, a murderer or a thief or an evildoer. We're going to talk about the fact of meddler. But, um, but we know there's violence in our heart, and there's violence in other people. And so we shouldn't be surprised when violence comes at us. And yet we echo, the echoes of Eden are in our heart. In the, the, the foretaste of the new creation where this doesn't happen are also in the heart of those who are following Jesus. And so in light of that, we go, this shouldn't be this way. And it is appropriate that we grieve, mourn, wail, that we struggle in the midst of suffering. Jesus did say in John 15, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. It is legitimate to expect it but there's also illegitimate what seriously in here and that that is and i i am a gnat at same as some of my prayers we think about other countries but is is we need to consider what american evangelicalism has done to us and expecting suffering um the illustration as you know i worked with the campus ministry for 20 years and one of the things we used to tell people about their faith especially early on we kind of changed it later but was this booklet called the four spiritual laws and it started with god loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life well very early on in our career we went to morocco we went to egypt and then morocco in morocco i got to watch as uh, up on the rooftop in a little play pool they baptized a, a college student who had come to faith he was being disowned by his parents. He had lost all his friends. Uh, he probably was not going get, to get a good job in his, uh, in his profession as he was finishing up his degree. Pull out that booklet and say to him, God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. We're, we're doing something with wonderful and plan there, aren't we? Because it's still true. Eschatologically, we might say it's still true. But that only, can I say it that strongly? Just kind of, it only works here, <laughs> that phrase. And, and how do we know, how do we learn, especially from the African-American church in America, but our church around the world, and as we go like, oh, the Christian nation of America, which never was Christian, but is falling apart, right? What does it mean if we have a suffering coming ahead of us or that we're in it beginning to be in there in this for the name of Christ suffering? Because American evangelicalism says, I love Kate Bowler's phrase instead. She says, instead, the message we get is live your best life now, right? You're, you're just live the best version of yourself. And that's what we think blessing looks like. I mean, I, I hate to say it, that's the name of one of Joel Olstein's books. I don't think Joel Olstein would sell well in North Korea. Um, and, and so, again, I don't, that's why I said I feel like I'm a gnat. 
Because what does this mean? And God changed me to understand this mindset because I have illegitimate ways where I say, why, Lord? Instead of places like that that are going like, what? This is filling up the sufferings of Christ. This is, this is Christian life, that suffering is a part of it. Now, to continue drawing down on this, it, because again, it's this mixture of going, it's legitimate, and also I have these, this mixed illegitimate. That's okay, the Lord loves us in the midst. We don't have to figure it out. But as I wanna just stop and think about the fact of what, what happens when you're surprised by suffering. This, I'll just share what happens with me. I dysregulate, right? I freak out. That's why I think he says, you know, don't think it is something strange, as though something right. And I start going like this, ought not being what's going on, and and, and again, Peter wants to address that, and I think he does in that word meddler. Here's what I mean. Notice in that verse, uh, where is it, 15? Yeah. If you're going to suffer, suffer as a Christian, but don't let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Do you notice that as gets repeated twice? That's in the original Greek, and they think it's for that reason. Notice how the first three go as a list. Don't suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, because what? Even those pagans in that day would have gone, of course, every natural theology view of ethics would go like, yeah, you shouldn't murder, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't do evil. But then Paul sets that one aside of a meddler, and it's a word, this is the only place it's not well used, not used much at all. And, and what it literally means, let me get this right, it means belonging to another is the first part of the Greek word, and then an overseer. It's the idea of, I am going to oversee what really belongs to you. I'm going to meddle in your business, right? I'm going to take care of things. And my point is this, is that not what we try to do when we face suffering? It's like the areas of my life that I really have no control over, I am going to control. I'm going to be angry at you and try and do that, or I'm going to fight back and fix my rights, or I'm going to, this is where shame for me comes in because I go, oh, it must be my fault. So, Excuse me for that word. It must be my fault. It must be my fault. And so if I just could be nice and change things, then you won't. Right? So like a commentator, one commentator wrote this. Like, what would that have looked like in Peter's age? Quote, this might have looked like censoring the behavior of outsiders on the basis of claims of having a higher morality. Does that not sound like we try to do in our government as Christians? Anyway, so, uh, so read that again. Censoring the behavior of outsiders on the basis of our Christian claims of having a higher morality. Or maybe interfering with family relationships or stirring up domestic or civil discontent or discord. Or maybe a tactless attempt to convert other people. Because in reaction, right, we react instead of moving forward as new creation. So Peter is aware that um, we have what, seriously? You know, we, we get angry we, we, and, and he's saying, Let's just be aware. I do, do want to say, I didn't know where to fit this, but I want to say this um, because uh, the other thing in this paradigm with our what seriously in our American response and going there is because in our affluence and all that, right, we, we are at this age where uh, we ask the why God question much more than our predecessors did and those around the world do. And that's an appropriate question to be wrestling with. But one thing I, I want to just point out quickly, because I heard it recently and I've been thinking on it and I want to share it with you, is uh, something Alvin Plantinga says. And that is, our culture and our hearts says, why, God? What's the reason for this suffering? And then especially those who cast off God say, if I can't see the reason, then there must not be a reason and God must be bad and write all these things cascade from them. Well, Alvin Plantinga uses this illustration. He goes, there's some assumptions in what we're saying that I must see the reason. He said, imagine you went camping and you have your tent set up and then I come along and we're standing there by the fire looking at your tent. And I say, is there anything in your tent? And there's a bear in your tent. And we all can see it. We can see through the little screen. We see the bear. It's massive. There's a bear. Let's get in the car until the bear leaves. Okay? But what if I come along, we're sitting there around the campfire and say, is there anything in your tent? No, there's nothing. You can see straight through it. But have you ever heard of these things called no -see -ums? I've had them with zzzz in my ear while I'm camping, right? And that's the whole point. They're there, but you don't see them. And could it be, we can only say could it be, that if there is a good God in control of things, that he has reasons we don't see. We want to see a bear, and he's going, trust me. 
There's things in this that you don't know. That's why we entrust ourselves to a faithful creator in this last one. Okay, so finish this up. The how are Christians to respond. The what, seriously, and some of the things that cascade from that. And then finally, the why Christians can respond this way. Verse 13, rejoice. So there's that command that you share in Christ's sufferings. That you what? Rejoice that you're suffering is what it should say, right? It's just me. No, I'm actually engaging in Christ's sufferings. And this is the grand story that is all over this passage of union with Jesus that comes by grace. That we get united to his work, united to his person, united to his righteousness. The great exchange, like Laura said, that he has taken our sin in this good news of what God is doing. And that he lays on us his perfect record. And in this mysterious union, Peter is drawing them back to the big story that you are part of God's story because you are in Christ. And yes, he suffered. That includes suffering. But don't forget your union because it's where we come and go the best person in the world suffered and the greatest good came out of it so when i go i need a no see him lord and he goes this is my no see him this is where you trust that i take suffering and i work in it not for nothingness that i'm not abandoning you in suffering but i am working in through and among and around it it is this gospel message of what jesus has done for you in union but it's not just 13 it, it sets it in the broader one because he says then you'll be glad in the glory to be revealed so again he's setting it in the four chapters of creation fall redemption consummation he's pointing them to their future hope saying that's the story you're in you have that hope and isn't that what's going on in 17 and 18 there's a lot going on in 17 and 18 i believe it on the cutting room floor but what is it with this idea that judgment begins with the house of god right i don't like that I, that's my what seriously but then it goes on to say but wow what about those who don't obey the gospel and if verse 18 if the righteous are scarcely saved the idea here is the fact that this has talked about the fact there is a judgment coming for evil jesus cross pointed to it his message and the return of God. There is a judgment coming, an, es an end times eschatological judgment, but it's already started. And God's people are experiencing it now. They will not experience it then. Why? Because they're hidden in Jesus and there will be a judgment, but they'll be safe in Jesus. So see how Peter is pulling together these threads of hope for the, his readers, that you are in the story of the good news of what Jesus has done. And then final place, he does it in this passage is 14, which blew me away. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because what? The spirit of glory and God rests upon you. Have you heard that phrase anywhere else today? Isaiah, David read it. And who was it about? The servant who was going to come and rescue God's people. But this says it is true about anyone who believes in that service. Why? Because it again is this mysterious union that if the spirit, why do you have the spirit? Because you're united to Jesus and he pours out his spirit. The spirit is working in him. And so if I'm part of his body, the spirit's working in me. It's this hope that you are part of God's big story, Christians who are resident aliens facing suffering. And see, that gives us the why the resources to face suffering and to have joy and blessing because I have a God who has me. I have a God who is good and cares and who in the mystery of suffering is working, right? These things so that it works this way. I haven't used this illustration in a while, but it's worth using once a year. I, um, early in my college career with our campus organization, when I was a student, I went on a summer project and there I met a girl who I think was from New York and she literally was just a metal engineer. I don't know what that would be like at UVA. I don't know. But it just she just handled metals and she was telling me what other this classic Christian illustration, but it's true that if you take a paper clip, right, let's take a paper clip, you bend it and then you put it back together. But if you have if you know your stuff like these engineers do, you and you probably know this already, too, you have broken the bonds of the metal. So it's not as strong anymore. That's why bent metal that gets straightened will sag more quickly. Right. And those kinds of things, because you've broken the bonds. How do you get the bonds re-strengthened? You heat the metal back up. We live in a world that wants to degrade our bonds and weaken us. The gospel is that flame 
that heats up the broken things in our lives, the broken motivations, the broken, that strengthens us back into the calling that God has for us as people. It is not a do it yourself, it is grace, and it is the gospel saturating as fire in the depth, the heat, to restructure the bent aspects of my heart. It is in that gospel that we celebrate and rejoice. Well, Peter is preparing us, may the Spirit prepare us, that we might suffer with grace. Let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we give you glory and praise and ask you to do your work. In our sin, we don't despair. In our weakness, we don't despair. But we look to you, conquering Savior, and say, don't finish what you started in us. Make us your people who love your word and your grace. In your name, we ask these things. And all God's people saying, Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing about our overcoming lamb as we move toward the table. shed for you while you were still clueless and rebellious and not even aware he loves you and offered himself for you if that is your faith that Jesus has come for you died for you lived for you died for you risen for you and you are one with him he offers this meal so that you wouldn't just hear me speaking words but that you'd be reminded in your hands and in your mouth that he loves you and that you are his. That's your faith. Come eat with us. This is Jesus' table, not a Presbyterian table or a Baptist table or a hope table. It is the table of hope, but his hope. That's your faith. Come eat with us. If it's not your faith, we're so glad that you're here. But we ask you not to eat this meal. This meal expresses faith. And so we ask you to be true to who you are. If you're not yet a person of faith, no shame in that. We, again, understand that people are at various places uh, in considering this. But if this is not yet your faith, please don't eat with us. And just consider maybe what this represents, these resources, as I called them earlier. But let's pause and pray and thank him for this meal. We pause asking you to take these normal things. They won't change to be that special, but it will be special, Lord, because you are here 
And so we ask that what we use the odd phrase of means of grace would be just that. They would be things you use to impress more deeply on your children. Your smile. In your name we pray. Amen. Apostle Paul wrote, The Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he given thanks as I did in his name, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Join me in our response. Is the Father with us? Yes. Is Christ among us? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit here? Yes. This is our God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Turn the page. We are his people. We are redeemed by his grace. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Feed on Christ in your hearts with thanksgiving. Drink. Remember that Christ died for you. We are going to do as we always do here still. If you are eating, partaking, hold out your empty hands and they'll put a packet uh, in those empty hands. Um, and we will, but wait, you can start opening the top, but wait, we will eat together. If you need gluten free, let raise your hand. I know free. Right? taps back and forth until the cellophane peels back and not the purple foil or pinky purple foil and grab your wafer I'll just repeat what we said before let us feed on Christ in our hearts with thanksgiving peel back the foil Drink, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you. Let us drink together. Please stand, and we'll sing our sending song.
you that you can point, we invite you to point to the cross with our first three responses and then point up where Christ ascended with the last one. Just a way to embody what we're doing. We invite you to do that. All our problems, we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties, we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works, we send to the cross of Christ. And all our hopes, we set on the risen Christ. Here, the Lord's good word. As we're going to be reading the end of Corinthians this week, I'll use the New Testament benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You are dismissed. We're heading out there for a picnic. Oops, I, because it's on the next page, I missed it. Cindy, that's, I believe, Adam's role. Thank you. Alive to God, dead to sin, we go out glorifying him in all things and eating at a picnic. So head on out.